Lauren. Let me join uh, with Lauren and uh, Reverend John earlier in welcoming you to this special Father's Day celebration and also to those who have chosen to join us on the World Wide Web. A very good morning to you all. It is certainly a privilege and an honor for me to have been asked <coughs> to share um, ideas about fatherhood. Um, but before I seek to do that, I'd invite uh, members from the congregation, either male or female, who will choose to share with us lessons learned from their dads. So for the next five or six minutes, we'll open the floor to members of our community who may feel to come forward and share briefly lessons learned from their dads. Don't come all at the same time. No one who wants to do that? That tends to happen when we speak about dads, eh? On Mother's Day, what would have been up here? Sure, Reverend John. Everybody knows my penchant for, for sexy socks. And I actually learned it from my dad. Uh, when I was a youngster growing up, young men were only allowed to wear black, blue, or brown socks. Usually knee high because we wore short pants until we were um, in sixth form at school. And I had an aunt who every year gave me a pair of socks, black, brown, or blue. And it used to irritate me so much that I, I wouldn't even open them. I just put them in, in the bottom drawer, you know, that was kept for bottom drawer things. Uh, but one year, Bill Haley and the Comets, how many of you are old enough to remember Bill Haley and the Comets? They were due to perform in Jamaica, and the rage was neon green, neon pink, and neon yellow socks that said, Bill Haley, rock around the clock. And I wanted a pair so badly. And it was near Christmas time. My father said, absolutely not. Only a certain kind of boy wears those kinds of colors. Black, brown, or blue is what boys wear. But my aunt gave me an early Christmas present. What does she normally give me? Yeah. And my father used to insist that we write a thank you note to everybody who gave us a present. So I said, oh God, here goes. Thank you note for the black, brown, or blue socks. And I put them in the bottom drawer. And dad said to me, son, you know, you must never make assumptions. You need to open your aunt's Christmas present. So I reluctantly went and opened the bottom drawer and took out what I knew was going to be a pair of black, brown, or blue socks. And in it was a pair, two tickets for Bill Haley and the Comets and a neon pink rock around the clock socks. <laughs> and it started me on my sock collection. That's why I have so much sock appeal. Thank you, Dad. Good morning, everyone. I am told by two good friends of mine that I talk too much. <laughs> so I promise that I'll be short, relatively short. Yes. Reverend Elma usually say that this earth on which we live this planet. We are all in school. And I'm here to say that I found that that is true. More importantly, <clears throat> I have three girls. And I find that they are my teachers. You take an exam every day and you're marked just as your teachers do. The result comes at times like these when you get a card when they express to you the love and all that you have done for them. Sometimes pull tears from your eye to see that children, even when they're growing up from down here, can say the most wonderful things. You know, <clears throat> 
there's a program called Turning Point on the television. I don't know how much of you watch it. But today they're talking about thoughts and what's your thought, what's your expression, what you say. And the speaker was telling us about the different kinds of expression. So we have to be very careful how we express to our children because they see us as their model. So I promise I will be very short, so I say to you, be careful because you're on the watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me from Oregon. Um, my father, a pretty wise man, um, loving man most of the time. Uh, he did have something that he departed particularly to us kids, which was that if he was out of town, well, let me preface it with this. Dads want to fix everything, right? We just want to fix it. And he said, if I'm out of town, and I would not likely buy an airfare back home early and something happens that I can do nothing about, don't tell me. Dads want to fix everything. And when it's not within our power to do so, that is excruciatingly painful. And he knew that if he would not buy a ticket, one of those situations where he would not buy a ticket back home, for a skinned knee, let me know about it when I get home and I will do all I can. But don't tell me till I can do something about it. Uh, my father, bless his soul, went to Monroe College and for our visitors, Monroe is a boarding school in rural Jamaica and it has, well, had a reputation for being a brutal school in terms of corporal punishment. So everything you did, you got a beating. If you didn't do anything, you still got a beating. <laughs> so I grew up in this household with that culture. And my father used to beat me mercilessly if he felt I wasn't doing what I ought to do. Um, and when I was 40 years old, of course, it was deep, painful to me, both physically and emotionally. When I was 40 years old and he was 70, which is just about three years before he died, I carried him to lunch. And I said, Daddy, tell me, why did you beat me so mercilessly as a child up to the age of 13 or 14, which incidentally stopped when my mother said, you cannot do this anymore. And it stopped. And he, he says, Douglas Roy, that's what he called me. I don't remember beating you that way. I was filled with love. I was trying to bring you up the way I knew. And he says, and I was doing other things for you. He says, for example, your teachers didn't turn up for classes at school. And I went and found them personally and said, you better get yourself back to school to teach my son maths and physics. I didn't know that. So the lesson I learned from this is that he was caring in his own way. He, did, he felt that was the best way. Um, I think he felt if he wasn't beating me, it was a sign he was loving me. <laughs> so, and um, the lesson I've learned from it is that fathers care in a different way, but also there's a more important lesson, and that is our culture and our society changes with the generations, and I believe that we are at the cusp of a change in the way that we treat our children in terms of this feeling in Jamaica and elsewhere that if we beat them, they're going to be better. Um, I was fortunate that it didn't scar me and that I had this reconciliation with my father before he died. God bless his soul. Thank you. Last one. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and happy Father's Day to all you fathers. 
my late father, he actually attended that same boarding school. <laughs> um, I didn't really hear from him about all that beating, but I, I know from hearing from others. But he was a man who just treated everyone, adults, children, animals, with our respect and sensitivity and gentleness, which was just um, awesome to us, and, and it blessed us. And, and, and so I, I, I learned to appreciate that approach. And the other thing that I think blessed me is that, you know, I, as we say here, you, you attract what you think about. That, that was the experience I knew. And when I look back now, I have attracted in, in my experience so many fathers, whether through friendships, um, Ken Main Douglas as such a father, um, Reverend John, I have fathers here, fathers at work, maybe fathers who, because I've read their memoir, fathers who would are were are just wonderful fathers. So you know, it is true that even up to yesterday, I hear on the radio somebody saying something about, oh, we don't really honor the fathers. Um, that's not true here, for one. But I must say, I have been privileged to know so many wonderful fathers, and that's been a lesson and a blessing to me. And so I, f I feel fine about what's happening. You know, as you said, that our, our culture is evolving to that appreciation of the importance of the role of fathers. Thank you, Daddy. So we thank our, our colleagues who have chosen to, to enrich this morning with their perspectives. Thank you very much. On my side, my own view of fatherhood is certainly an essential concept that has kept evolving through the years. And this view continually and continues to evolve. As a young parent, I recall my, my focus in terms of young babies. You, you worry about them, you, you protect them. Your overarching concern is about protection and, and, and nurturing care, particularly the physical nurturing care. And then when they, they get a little older, you're, you, you're more concerned about, let's say, the teen years. You focus on balancing that trust and that oversight. And you seek trying to hope that you're creating the right balance. And usually when you think you haven't done a good job, you always remind your children that you've never done it before and that there's no course in parenting. But that's one of the balances you keep trying, trying to create. And certainly my experience as a father has been like that. And once my children became adults, then that focus of fatherhood then was, con con was kind of concentrated around giving them emotional support in their life and the choices that they were making. And as a grandfather, you have the ultimate lesson of minding your own business. <laughs> Understanding that they're your children to love and spoil and learn from and communicate to them in different ways, your family history. But it is the parents' responsibility to parent. And so uh, parents that have shared their ideas with me have had the same experience of, of sometimes putting hands in your pocket when you think that something should be done differently because it's not your business. Your business is to help them to do their thing as parents. So that whole experience for fatherhood for me has been certainly an evolving one. Um, but one of the most fascinating evolutions for me is in recent years understanding my understanding of fatherhood in terms of my understanding of, my, of sonship. I never focused too much on the sonship relationship with my father until in till many later years. And the fact that the important part of fatherhood is what was your relationship with your father 
as a son and how has that influenced how you operate? Matter of fact, I was watching a program on Facebook, um, Red Table Talk with Jada Pinkett Smith. Um, she's the wife of Will Smith. Very interesting conversations that she has on Facebook with her mother and her children about different subjects. And this one is about parenting. And she made a statement which really resonated with me. She said, you know, we come into parenting with our own childhood experiences. And we hope we can fix many of those experiences with our own parenting of our children. And she said, but you can't fix everything because each child is going to come with its own unique demands on you. And so it resonated because I remembered that when I was a teenager and the hormones started acting up, I had the courage in that environment, in our culture in those days, to say to my mother, I'm really upset with my father because he doesn't attend my sporting events. I used to go to championships every year for Monroe and St. George's. I used to play tennis for Monroe and St. George's. My father never ever saw me run, he never ever saw me play tennis. And I said to my mom, this is just very hurtful. And my mother was a rather wise lady. And she sat me down and said to me, your father's father left his mother before he was born. He never saw a model of what a father should do. But when you guys were kids, although he was a school principal, he would put me in the room and lock the door and say, Doris, go and sleep. The night was his with the babies. And I'd seen other evidences of my father's protective nature to us. So her lesson to me and her statement to me just completed the cycle so I could understand that what I'd seen in my father, the very many loving aspects, this was not an issue that I should focus on, that he truly loved us in his own way and as best as he could. And the gift that he gave to me in that lapse of absence from my sport activities was I never missed anything that my kids were involved in. I don't care what it was. It was an intra-class debating tournament at St. George's. I'm at the back of the room, one period. But my son is debating form two or form three. So that was a gift. And so we should not underestimate the role and the relationship of our sonship with our fathers as to how we continue to communicate. But you know, when all is said and done, all our thoughts, all our insights, all our actions, all our inspirations related to our role as a father are in fact under the role of Heavenly Father. Remember, John in the blessing of the baby this morning spoke very clearly. Fatherhood and parenting, fatherhood is a divine assignment. It's a sacred responsibility. And we can't conduct our divine assignments and we can't conduct our sacred responsibilities in as best a way as we can if we are not conscious of the relationship between ourselves and our Heavenly Father. That guidepost is what is going to allow us in our role of fatherhood to be as expansive and as supportive and as loving and as patient and as understanding and as insightful and as questioning as we can do. Passage from our science of mind text says, describes the father, mother, God as the universal parent, mind, and spirit. And it's truly our conscious view of who we are in our relationship with God that in fact is going to fashion and influence the quality of who we are as earthly fathers. And if we allow ourselves to think back, we can surely identify signal events in our lives where the divine inspiration and the divine intervention and the divine message and the divine learning in our role as parents was very, very upfront. When my son, just over a year old, was in children's hospital from a very bad attack of gastroenteritis, and the doctor pulled me aside by one of those hedges outside the children's hospital ward, and he said, 
you know, you need to know this because you're the man of the house. I can't tell your wife, and you can't tell her either. But I don't expect your son to last through the night. You need to know this. And so we lived in Edgewater at the time. I just got married our first house, so we lived in Edgewater. The long drive home to Portmore, sleeping in the night, the long drive back in the morning to the hospital. I'm glad he was wrong. <laughs> but surely, that was a very important divine experience because I didn't understand, A, that I could, didn't tell her that I slept and that I drove back to Kingston with a feeling of confidence. I can't tell you up to this day the understanding of that. I already told you about my maternal intervention, my mother's giving me the information on my father. That was certainly a very divine experience, a divine occurrence. And I was very divinely fortunate to choose the mother I did because she was a very conscious lady. She was a Catholic, a Catholic in the days long before ecumenism. And my mother would say to me, we're all one children of God. So when your friends or your Catholic friends are not participating in Anglican church service or funerals or weddings because they're Catholics, foolishness. Participate because there's only one God. So I had that blessing and that support. And years later when I was in an executive development program at the University of Illinois, and they were doing a subject of leadership. And it was led by a very famous psychiatrist at the time and he was speaking about leadership and the effect of family relationships have on leadership in the corporate environment. And he said, you know, one of the mistakes we make all the time is that we put our children in a mold. One solution, one program. But they're not. They're very unique. They're very unique individuals. And at that time, we had had our third child. And we were having that experience. We had strong parenting conflicts about how we dealt with our third child because she was very different from the other two. I was just in time for her to come back to Jamaica and say to my wife, Maxine, we're doing this thing wrong. You've got to treat her differently. And, oh. and, and that was a very big healing experience for us. That's how we continued to conduct our parenting with our third child. And certainly, when I joined this temple, God bless that moment in 1984, it then allowed me, at a time when my kids were just getting into preteen years, to really be a consultant to my kids, to learn to trust them, to respect them, and know that they would make the right decisions. I called my youngest child after a breakup with her then boyfriend, and she started listing the things that she didn't like. And I said, yes, I saw them all. And I would give her the examples that match her listing. And she looked at me and says, Daddy, you are just crazy. I swear to you that if I was stepping back to the end of a cliff, you wouldn't say I'm going to fall over. <laughs> I said, I trusted you to see the things that you needed to see. And if you didn't see them, then I trust you that that was the right person for your life. Because I wasn't going to marry him, it was you. <laughs> so it allowed me to really give them a boldness in life to go for it and be respectful. My first child got married after her third engagement. And when she said to me, Daddy, boy, you know, this is my third engagement, and boy, you know, I feel kind of weird, I feel weird about it. I said, I'm so proud of you. Because each time you made the decision that this wasn't for you, and look at what you have today. The perfect husband, perfect father. Yes, you have to allow them to do the things and give them those spiritual muscles. And the Temple of Light did that for me. And I am forever, forever, forever grateful. Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, <clears throat> and Thou our potter, and we all are the work of Thy hand. Yes, we are truly the work of the Heavenly Father. We truly are the result 
of that unique creation, those unique parts that we're allowed to take and to be and to express. And this uniqueness, we of course, in our consciousness, express that in our roles as fathers. It's a privilege and it's an honor to be a father. In fact, it's a greater privilege and honor to be the child of a heavenly father with the ability to understand the relationship and to employ that understanding in our parenting as fathers of our children here on earth. What a privilege. What a blessing. It's a blessing that I share with all the fathers, those persons adoptive or biological, those who have parented and fathered in different roles, in the church here, at work, in your community, wherever. All of us who have been blessed with the opportunity to be fathers, I reiterate, it's a privilege, it's a blessing, it's an honor. And I love to share that with you today and all the other days. Thank you very much.